So, you've got an idea for a business. The store of your dreams. There's just one thing to figure out. Everything. That's why Shopify's all-in-one commerce platform makes it easy to sell online, in person, and everywhere else. Sell on social media, source products with an app to get that first sale feeling. It's the only solution that gives you everything you need to sell everywhere you want. So when you're ready to bring your idea to life, power it up with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash listen. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the Age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 3, Episode 7, The Death of Royalist Ireland. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Before we begin, I'd like to thank new additions to the House of Lords. Harold, Duke of Hanson. Earl, totally not biased. Chris, Earl of Marsh. Alexandra, Viscountess Latimore. Ed, Baron Chunsky. Baron Alec. Baron Jorge. And Baron Russell. Like all other patrons, they can now listen to this episode and every other episode ad-free. The new Duke and Earls can also listen to the bonus content, Last week, we started a new bonus series on the history of the Mughal Empire. We've started with the founder of the empire, Babur Timur, and his early life as just another Timurid prince in the violent and unstable world of the collapsed Timurid Empire. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. Also, this year's Intelligent Speech Conference is in a month's time. There are some great shows attending. Our Fake History for one, History on Fire is another. Go to intelligentspeechonline.com to find out more. As was hopefully clear from the last narrative episode, Oliver Cromwell might have left Ireland, but that did not mean that the Irish War was over. Cromwell was satisfied that Ireland was no longer a potential threat to Republican England. The Royalist cause was in dire straits, its leadership divided, its armies deserting, and parliamentarian garrisons holding the most important ports, castles, and towns. But while Cromwell considered his mission accomplished, he left his son-in-law, Henry Ireton, to finish the job. Ireton was faced with a different kind of war. Disease, including plague, was rife. Dysentery had burnt through Cromwell's army over the previous winter, and the plague, which seems to have hit Ireland in 1649, would dominate Ireton's time in the kingdom, reaching a peak with an outbreak in Dublin in the summer of 1651. None of this was helped by famine, which was also common across the country, spread partly by parliamentarian tactics of scorched earth. Ireton might have been hampered by the fact that, soon after taking command of the Irish theatre, he had to compete for resources as the war with Scotland begins. Fortunately for Ireton, and unfortunately for Ormond, the Commonwealth regime was fully capable of sending men, money and material to Ireland while maintaining the war with Scotland. In the spring of 1650, seven more regiments arrived for Irish service, and with the Irish Sea pacified, parliamentary shipping had no problem supplying what the new Lord Deputy needed. In contrast, Ormond and the Royalists were stuck with a steadily shrinking territory from which to draw recruits and supplies. It was this logistical consistency, more than anything else, which assured English victory in Ireland. On the 30th of July, 1650, after Cromwell departed the kingdom and left Ireton in charge, the new Lord Deputy issued a declaration and proclamation of the Deputy General of Ireland concerning the present hand over God in the visitation of the plague. In form and function, it was very similar to Cromwell's declaration in January, just before his lightning campaign into Munster. 
It starts, I would say, strong. Quote, Ireland, it hath pleased the Lord our God now a long while to stretch forth his heavy hand over this nation in general and the inhabitants thereof in those capital judgments of the sword and pestilence with somewhat of famine also in many places, end quote. Very end of days stuff. Ireton is clear that God's heavy hand was falling on Protestants and the godly as much as on Catholics, and he calls on all men everywhere to repent, fast, and pray, although not in Catholic practice, of course. As far as Ireton and those close to him were concerned, the plague was a message from God. Ireton demanded that his army, a godly army, set an example for everyone else, especially the Catholic Irish. He insisted that the first, second, and third Tuesdays in the following August be set aside by his soldiers as days of fasting, prayer, and public humiliation. He repeatedly forbade his men, and especially his officers, from swearing, blaspheming, drinking, plundering, and general cruelty towards those under their protection. But we shouldn't sugarcoat this. Ireton shared the standard English view of the Irish, that their culture was backwards, their language barbarous, their use of land wasteful, and their Catholicism superstitious. These views were only intensified by the 1641 rebellion, and like many veterans of the civil wars, Ireton's political and religious views radicalised over the decade. Like many English, he was determined that the, quote, original authors of the rebellion, end quote, and its massacres would face justice. Like his father-in-law, Ireton held particular contempt for the Catholic clergy, who he saw as using superstition to delude the ordinary people of Ireland in order to maintain their own positions of power and influence. It was the clergy, not the ordinary Irish people, who were merely, quote, deluded popish people, that were to be held accountable for, quote, so much crying innocent blood, whereof they generally stand guilty, and for, quote, abominable treachery, towards all that concur not with them in their own superstitions, idolatry, and affected ignorance, or indeed that worship not the beast as they do." Ireton viewed his role in Ireland as a holy warrior in a godly cause. Ireland was plague-ridden, famine-struck, and torn apart by bloodshed, not because of any mundane reasons of politics or ethnic division, but because of providence because God was a wrathful God, and must be appeased. Facing Ireton was Ormond and the Royalist Coalition. The alliance between Protestant and Catholic, with Protestant Ormond as its leader, continued to collapse. At the heart of the issue was religion. Protestant Royalists, both English and Irish, were viewed with outright suspicion by their Catholic colleagues. Many had defected back to Parliament when the going got tough, Those who remained were resented for the outsized influence they still held. Lord Inchiquin, the Protestant Gaelic Irishman, after having been intercepted by his old colleague and rival Lord Broghill last episode, had withdrawn to Connacht with a skeleton force. Inchiquin's enemies among the Royalists were Legion. He was Murrah of the Burnings, responsible for the massacre and desecration of Cashel, and in March his enemies in the Royalist leadership struck insisting that they were driven only by cruel financial necessity, the commissioners of treaty suggested that Protestant forces be disbanded, and their troops and officers come to their own terms with the parliamentary regime. Ormond was clinging to whatever scraps of authority he still held, and he wanted to avoid any, quote, national distinction or quarrel, and so he bowed to the pressure. On the 26th of April, just before he moved on Clonmel, Cromwell had signed an agreement at Cashel. As long as they did not act against the Commonwealth regime, Protestant former royalists were allowed to disarm and settle anywhere in Ireland, or go into exile, if they so wished. In Ulster, the Scottish commander George Munro came to similar terms with Parliament. Two of the names specifically excluded from this deal were Ormond and Inchiquin. Both were far too involved in the royalist cause, too high profile to be given the same generous offer. But one of the royalist representatives returned to Ormond from Cashel with two passes of safe conduct nevertheless. If Ormond took the offer and left the kingdom, all the better. But even if he didn't, it looked very bad for Ormond to be offered a way out, even if he didn't accept it. 
It was a cunning piece of diplomacy, and Ormond worked it out right away. He immediately and publicly returned the passes to Cromwell with a note, quote, When you shall desire a pass from me, and I think fit to grant it, I shall not make use of it to corrupt any that commands unto you, end quote. In other words, I know what you just tried to do. Whether or not Ormond and Inchiquin were included in the deal, this marked the effective death of the Catholic-Protestant coalition. It had started with such public enthusiasm just 15 months before, but with mutual suspicion and incrimination, and the baggage of eight years fighting a war against each other, it was always going to be difficult to hold together. Faced with a relentless series of defeats, defections from Protestant soldiers, desertions from Catholic soldiers, continued rivalry between royalist officers, public and private criticism from Catholic clergy, ethnic divisions between Gaelic, Old English and New English royalists, and the lack of a unifying figure who stood above it all, their king, Charles II, it's almost impressive how long it did survive. Ormond, however, did not give up. But, with the departure of most of the remaining Protestants under his command, meant he now relied almost entirely on Catholics, and many of those actively despised him. One of those who didn't, the Marquess of Clan Rickard, Ulick Burke, tried to patch things up between the Lord Deputy and the bishops, who were now openly working against Ormond. In March 1650, the bishops met the Commissioners of Treaty in Limerick, and together they presented a list of demands to Ormond. To sum them up, they wanted to remove Ormond's autocratic powers, and insisted on power sharing between him and the Catholic lords and bishops. Ormond did not accept their demands, and the political dispute escalated. Ormond suspected that the bishops were giving support to the civilian authorities in Limerick. Why was that a bad thing? Well, because they were rejecting Ormond's authority. The Lord Deputy understood that once Ireton secured the southeast of Munster, Limerick would be his next target, and he wanted to install a garrison in the town under a commander of his choosing. But Limerick refused to let his troops in, and insisted they pick their own governor. The Lord Deputy suspected, probably rightly, that the clerical faction was giving the city leaders covert encouragement. This rejection of his authority was spreading, and Ormond began to consider, and threaten, to leave Ireland entirely, taking his commission with him, and leaving the Catholic Irish to fend for themselves. In April, an assembly of royalist leaders, all but one of them Catholic, that one being Inchiquin, met at Loch Ray. This meeting was hostile to Ormond, who didn't attend, complaining that he had not addressed their previous complaints. But by the end of the gathering, the assembly agreed to help resolve the standoff over Limerick, which did indeed happen, and Ormond's choice of commander was given control of the garrison. Ormond clung on as Lord Deputy, and he prepared to weather the storm of Ireton's campaign. The English war with Scotland could achieve a restoration of Charles II in Britain, and even if it didn't, it might siphon enough English attention and resources to allow a reversal in Irish fortunes. Civil war in England had done that before, after all. The Royalists still controlled large territories in Ireland, including Connacht, which was mostly untouched by war and sheltered by the River Shannon. They'd lost most of Ireland's ports, but there remained some, Limerick and Galway in particular, which could be bridgeheads for foreign supplies and troops. The Irish position wasn't entirely hopeless. I just mentioned that Ormond's choice was made the commander of Limerick, Colonel Piers Walsh. But that didn't mean the city was under his control. Far from it. For months, the Lord Deputy and the city authorities argued and struggled over how much autonomy Limerick would sacrifice for the war. Ormond's governor was accepted, but his garrison was not. An angry mob, suspecting that Ormond planned to flee the kingdom on a Dutch ship, attacked that ship, and searched the containers Ormond was sending abroad for Irish tax money to feather his nest in exile. They didn't find any, and they apologised. Ormond's chosen governor, Walsh, complained to him that the garrison he was allowed was barely armed, and that he suspected this was deliberate in order to maintain civilian authority. He also warned Ormond not to come to the city without a heavy guard, not just for his safety, but because his arrival in person would bring the dispute over authority to a head, 
and Ormond would have to assert his control by force. Mihol Oshuka argues that, now that Walsh was in command, Ormond should have diffused the situation by backing off and focusing on other battles, like the actual battles that were taking place. Victory was the best convincer, after all. But, in the opinion of Oshukru, Ormond was already, quote, in the grip of denial of any crisis other than the refusal of Limerick to fully accept his authority, and he would not be diverted by issues elsewhere, end quote. Eventually, Ormond accepted Hugh Dove O'Neill, hero of Clonmel, as the new governor of Limerick, although this didn't solve the political dispute. Money and men were still not forthcoming from Limerick, and soon Galway followed Limerick's example, refusing to accept a garrison until under direct threat from Parliament, and also insisting that they pick their governor. The Lord Deputy was losing all control. He even threatened a military blockade of Galway until they accepted his authority. Ormond's position only grew worse when rumours from Scotland reached him in August. The gossip was that Charles II had come to a deal with the Covenanters more next week, and part of that deal was the public denunciation of the Second Ormond Peace and any concessions to Irish Catholics. This was the final straw for the Catholic clergy. Despite assurances from Ormond that these rumours were unconfirmed, on the 12th of August, they publicly condemned Ormond's record as Lord Deputy and his political and military failures, and while calling on all Catholics to resist the parliamentarian advance, relieved them of any responsibility to Ormond. On the 16th of August, Charles would in fact come to an agreement with the Covenanters, but as we'll see, Charles hated this deal. Around the same time, a provincial assembly in what was left of Royalist Ulster elected the Marquis of Clanricard as their general. Clanricard, despite publicly and privately insisting he would not replace Ormond as the Royalist leader, was the most likely candidate. Not a fantastic candidate, of course, but the best of a bad lot. Charlemont, the last Catholic stronghold in Ulster, fell soon afterwards and the pressure on Ormond to leave Ireland rose to immense levels. Even Clan Rickard began to suggest that Ormond had two options. Leave Ireland, or gather what forces he could, and strike against Parliament to prove his doubters wrong. Ormond did neither. He continued to view his enemies within the Royalist cause as a higher priority than Ireton. He refused to leave, or surrender his commission as Lord Deputy without a direct order from Charles II in Scotland. It was radio silence from Edinburgh, though, where Charles II was now not quite a prisoner, but certainly not a fully independent actor. Ormond wrote to royalists still in Europe, complaining that unless he received supplies, and unless England's attention was diverted to Scotland, Ireland would be lost to the king. The parliamentarian advance appeared unstoppable, and the royalists were arguing amongst themselves. But the parliamentarians were not free from internal politics, although their squabbles were far less militarily damaging than those of the royalists. Lord Broghill, the man who had done so much to secure Munster for Parliament, fully expected to be rewarded with the thing that he seems to have craved the most throughout all these years of war, the Lord Presidency of Munster. So it's surprising that in April of 1650, Cromwell bestowed the Lord Presidency on Henry Ireton. It must have been an intentional slight. Broghill had made no secret about his ambition for the position, and Broghill was pissed. Even Royalists commented on the scandal, although their hopes that this would mean Broghill would defect back to the Royalists were a bit enthusiastic. Nevertheless, Broghill and Ireton's relationship, previously fairly warm, cooled. After Cromwell left, and Ireton took on the Lord Deputyship of Ireland, Broghill was again passed over in the selection of the Irish Army's Lieutenant General of Horse. Not only would it be a recognition of his talents as a cavalry commander, but it came with a very useful salary for the cash-strapped Baron. Instead, the position went to Edmund Ludlow. Ludlow himself records how Broghill was more qualified for the position, especially because of his knowledge of Ireland key positions in the new parliamentary regime of Ireland, both military and civilian, were given to others. 
Broghill wrote to Ireton to complain at being overlooked, listing his achievements and qualifications, and insisting that he would not follow the commands of anyone other than Cromwell and Ireton himself. And indeed, Broghill sits out the rest of 1650. The relationship between the two men improves slightly in 1651, but only slightly, and soon afterwards Broghill's remaining regiments were taken from him, and he himself sidelined. But this squabble hardly compared to Ormond's troubles. My brother-in-law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to selectquote.com. Selectquote.com. That's selectquote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at selectquote.com/commercials. Madame Tussaud. We all know the name and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name. But you may not realise the historical significance of the woman behind the name, or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Tussaud won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn, and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. Ireton's first objective after taking command was to capture the last two major royalist positions in southern Munster, Duncannon and Waterford, both of which had resisted attacks during Cromwell's campaign, the former by Ireton himself. Ireton marched on Waterford and called on the garrison to surrender. The commander, our old friend Thomas Preston, refused. But the resolve of the townsfolk was not as strong, especially because the garrison's supplies, including gunpowder, were almost out. As Ireton set about sighting his artillery, the leading figures of Waterford begged Preston to just give up, and so he did. Duncannon capitulated a week later, and Southern Munster was now secure. Ireton turned his attention towards Limerick and the province of Connacht. One of Ireton's subordinates, Hardress Waller, reached Limerick in October and demanded its surrender, which was refused by O'Neill. Ireton himself gathered his forces at Athlone, which sits on the River Shannon and straddles the border between the counties of Westmeath and Roscommon and the provinces of Leinster and Connacht. Ireton aimed to capture the town and use it to cross the formidable River Shannon. The advance of Ireton's forces reminded the Royalists that they were fighting a war here, although it didn't last long. Ormond had attempted to orchestrate the resistance, and he had some military success. Meanwhile, the clerical faction attempted to smooth things over, urging Catholics to fight, and attempting to belay the latest condemnation of Ormond from being read from the pulpits. They mostly failed at that, though, and this spelled the end of the very short-lived unity between Ormond and the bishops. In response, Ormond had the Bishop of Killaloe arrested, which only antagonised the rest of the clergy even more. The bishops reiterated their censure of Ormond and excommunicated any Catholic who served him, and this was once the nuclear option. But the last few years had seen many excommunications issued by the papal nuncio Rinuccini and the clerical faction, 
and its effectiveness against Catholic nobility had waned. But it was still an effective weapon to pressure ordinary Catholic Irish, and now Lord Inchiquin advised Ormond to throw in the towel. As a Protestant, he could not lead a Catholic campaign without the support of the Catholic Church, and especially not in the face of active and public attack from the Catholic clergy. On the 30th of September, Ormond accepted reality, and he decided that when he left, he would hand his position of Lord Deputy over to Clan Rickard, and began making arrangements to leave. Clan Rickard seems to have preferred exile with his friend, Ormond, but if he left, any lingering royal authority would evaporate, and this convinced him to remain. Ireton soon decided that he didn't have the boats or the resources to attempt to take Athlone, or the river crossing, before winter set in, so he moved his army south and joined Waller at Limerick. But within the walls, despite the factions, the newly elected mayor and O'Neill were resolute. Ireton, like earlier at Athlone, decided that starting a siege at the end of autumn would be a terrible idea, and he pulled his forces back. Clan Rickard attempted an offensive which had some success, but a counter-attack by parliamentarian forces scattered his men and meant he had to withdraw to winter quarters on a sour note. Over the winter, the royalists remained divided. Ormond was still there, lingering like a bad smell. He tried to play for more time after receiving word, via third parties, of his king's justification for denouncing the Second Ormond Peace. Charles had refused to consider it, until his life was threatened by his Scottish subjects. This, Ormond insisted, was proof that the Second Ormond Peace was still valid, as its denunciation had been made under duress. The bishops did not find this convincing, and instead said that Charles's declaration had effectively removed Ormond's commission as Lord Deputy. Instead, they proposed a return to the Confederate government. But the bishops had learnt from the mistakes of Rinaccini. His high-handed rule and his coup d'etats had backfired, and the bishops now insisted that any new government be ratified by an assembly, clearly believing that the majority of Catholic Irish were behind them. Ormond, realising that his final bid for time had failed, prepared to leave the kingdom, until he changed his mind again and decided to stay so that he could defend his position and reputation at the assembly. When the assembly met in November, the charges of Ormond's incompetence and failure were put forward, and so were his responses. A committee was appointed to consider the matter, and it had Ormond's allies on it, but also many of his enemies. When the committee emerged from their debate, they once again requested that Ormond hand over his authority to a, quote, acceptable successor, meaning Clan Rickard. Even now, Ormond dragged his feet and he attempted to safeguard whatever government he left behind from interference from the bishops. In the end, it was Parliament that forced Ormond to face reality. Threatened by a parliamentary blockade of Galway, Ormond abruptly gave up his politicking. He wrote to Clan Rickard, and sent him the King's Commissioner as Lord Deputy. Then, he boarded a ship and sailed to France. This is not the last that Ireland or this podcast will see of Ormond. Over the winter of 1650-51, to more reinforcements arrived from England, including Edmund Ludlow, who had been appointed Ireton's Lieutenant General of Horse earlier in 1650, but had only just arrived. Parliament's armies in Ireland continued to swell, and by the summer of 1651, Ireton could call on between 30,000 and 35,000 men. This was despite plague burning through many hundreds of them. In comparison, the Royalists had about the same number under arms, but divided under different commands in different counties and with little chance of linking up. In June, Ireton's final campaign began. Choosing an alternative crossing at Killaloe, Ireton breached the geographic barrier of the River Shannon and then marched north up its western bank towards Athlone. Meanwhile, Charles Coote marched south out of Ulster. With enemies on both sides of the river, Viscount Dillon, the commander of Athlone, who had held out the previous year, surrendered the town without a fight. Accusations of treachery have dogged him ever since. Now, the River Shannon was no longer an obstacle to Parliament. 
As one source colourfully puts it, quote, The said Shannon, the Irish bulwark and loyal spouse of the nation, was now become a prostitute, rendering free passage unto all comers, and denied any favour unto its former possessors, end quote. Then, Ireton marched on Limerick, and after two weeks of fighting and manoeuvring, Ireton had isolated the town from both banks of the River Shannon. Limerick was divided into two parts. English Town, which sat on King's Island, surrounded by the River Shannon, and Irish Town, on the mainland, but guarded by a wall and moat. His attempt to storm Toman Bridge across the river was defeated when the defenders blew it up with explosives before his army could cross. An amphibious assault over the Shannon was then attempted, and failed, and so Ireton settled in to starve the defenders out. Ireton's forces held Toman Fort, next to the destroyed bridge on the west bank of the Shannon, and he set about establishing siege lines and forts of his own, on the southern approach to the town, effectively sealing Limerick away from the outside world. Fort Ireton and Fort Cromwell were built as part of these southern siege works. The last pitched battle of the Irish War took place on the 12th of July, as Viscount Muskery attempted to relieve the siege of Limerick. Lord Broghill intercepted him at Knocknaclashy, and although Muskery outnumbered Broghill, and the Irish fought tenaciously, Broghill's better use of the terrain and superior parliamentary cavalry won the day. Muskery fell back to Ross Castle, losing about 500 men from a force of 3,000, killed and captured. Broghill ordered the execution of many of the prisoners he'd taken, saving the officers for ransom. Meanwhile, Clan Rickard hoped for intervention from abroad, specifically a rather harebrained scheme from the Duke of Lorraine, who Irish representatives agreed would become protector of Ireland. This plan doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. Besides the practical issues of sending an army to Ireland when the French refused access to their ports, it was yet another source of division among the Royalists. Clan Rickard rejected the agreement outright, as did many others who were likewise blindsided by the terms. The Irish representatives had only been sent to acquire financial and military support. They were not authorised to invent and offer this Protector of Ireland title. But towns like Galway actively welcomed the agreement, leading Clan Rickard to accuse Galway's leaders of treason. Lorraine would send supplies to Ireland, but any ambition to become its protector in the absence of the Stuarts was never a realistic option. In Limerick, as summer turned to autumn, O'Neill was determined to hold out, but Ireton was equally determined to capture the town quickly. Starving the garrison out was an option, but it would take time. According to Ireton, on the suggestion of God, several siege guns were moved to Fort Cromwell, and began battering the southern walls on the 22nd of October. With God as his siege engineer, it's no surprise that the walls began to crumble faster than O'Neill could repair them. With his garrison succumbing to disease and starvation, he didn't believe he could pull off another Clonmel defence, and that was even if Ireton fell for the same trick. So, three days after the cannons began to fire, he sued for terms. Two days after that, Limerick surrendered. Another act from Clonmel, which O'Neill couldn't repeat, was his escape, and he was taken prisoner. A number of Limerick elites were exempted from the terms of surrender, and several were executed for maintaining the siege. O'Neill was, according to Edmund Ludlow's much later reporting, due to be shot at Ireton's express order. But Ludlow insists that he and others managed to talk the vengeful Lord Deputy down. O'Neill would be sent back to England as a prisoner, escorted by Ireton. From a certain point of view, anyway. Because as we've seen in these episodes on the Commonwealth's campaign in Ireland, regardless of how highly ranked you were or how effectively you commanded troops, you could still be defeated by microscopic armies. And so, after a short fever, Henry Ireton, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, son-in-law to Oliver Cromwell, died. He was buried in a state funeral in Westminster Abbey. When Ireton died, he left the war unfinished, but only just. Galway was the last remaining royalist holdout of any size, but it wouldn't last long. The city and Lord Deputy Clan Rickard were divided after the Lorraine Agreement. Clan Rickard could, theoretically, call on the 3,000-man garrison of Galway, 
and the army of 2,000 under Thomas Preston in northern Connacht. And that was it. That was the extent of the Royalist military force. Clan Rickard opened negotiations with Edmund Ludlow, who succeeded Ireton as overall parliamentary commander. The only real bargaining chip the Royalists had was that theoretical foreign assistance could turn the tide, and Ludlow was not scared. When negotiations between the opposing leadership stalled, Charles Coote took the initiative and just offered Galway generous terms, which were accepted on the 12th of April. And that was it. Clan Rickard was outraged that his authority had been undermined, and he swore that Irish resistance would continue, and it would. But the campaign launched by Cromwell and continued by Ireton was over. But not the fighting. The war in Ireland now transformed into a guerrilla war, and, as Oshukru puts it, its final and most tragic phase. But that will be for another time, when we return to Ireland in the future to see how parliamentary rule and the guerrilla war will permanently alter Irish society, as thousands of people are killed and are transplanted around the island and beyond. Next time it's time to catch up with Scotland, because as we've been hinting throughout these episodes on Ireland, as the royalist position in Ireland collapsed, it left young Prince Charles with only one option, the Scots. Thank you to my House of Lords, including but not limited to the King's favourite Mike Sanders, Damien, Duke of Portland, Philip Allen, Marquess of Beaumont and Cressford, John Watson, Earl of Hillary. Remember that you can join the mailing list to be notified about new episodes and news about the show by going to the link in the description. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. My brother-in-law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials.